And exactly a month from today, we're going to make a decision that will determine our future security. I believe that leaving the EU would put our security at huge risk. The US, India, China, Australia, every single one of our allies, the Bank of England, the IFS, the IMF, the CBI, five former NATO Secretary Generals, the Chief Exec of the NHS, and most of the leaders of the trade unions in Britain all say that you, Boris, and Nigel are wrong. Why should the public trust you over them? Which happens one month today. We, the people, are being cajoled, frightened, and bullied into surrendering our democracy and freedom. This film is a rallying cry. We must fight for our independence, for the right to determine ourselves. Good afternoon, this is Alan's story of well-read films. We're here in Birmingham. Uh, we're going to be looking at the question that this country is going to be looking at on the 23rd of June. Should the UK remain a member of the European Union or should we in fact leave? Now you've seen there's all kinds of stuff coming through your door. I mean, uh, here's the truth, here's the that, etc. Well, we're going to have a somewhat different debate different than the kind of thing you've seen on television the other day, the debates in the newspaper. What's going to be different about it is, first of all, we're going to have three positions being defended here. One is remain, one is leave, and one is abstain. Second, this is going to be a discussion and debate among socialists. There's nobody here from the CBI. There's nobody here from the Tory party. We are socialists debating this question. The third thing is, we're not going to be engaging in any cheap shots, name calling, I'm going to make sure, as I've already told them, we don't want any of that. That's just no time for that. So we're not, now to be clear, we're not going to get any discussions about EU and bananas, a, a kind of fixation of Boris Johnson about what shape the bananas can be. Um, I doubt that any of the debaters are going to list off, uh, rhyme off a list of institutions of international capital as uh, combative journalist Faisal Assel did in the video you just saw, uh, and then have us conclude that if the World Bank says that Brexit is a bad idea, well, in fact, we should follow their advice. Um, I'm not expecting any attacks on refugees, on immigrants that have polluted our media for so much. These last few months have not exactly been Britain's finest hour, and some of us are quite worried what's coming on that front. So, if you're expecting this debate to be something like that, you might as well switch off. That's not what we're here for. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have five rounds here, and we just finished round one. In the second round, we're going to have the three debaters each give their positions. Then, in fact, we're going to have some questions I'm going to ask them in round three. Round four is going to be the actual kind of full-on debate, and round five is going to then be a wrapping up. So, we're now in round two, and we're going to have three 90-second statements. Kat? We in the Green Party, we would like to remain in the EU, although we, we do recognise it is not perfect. But we think that we have to address international problems, problems that don't recognise any borders, including climate change, the refugee crisis, air pollution, international tax avoidance, inequality, workers' rights, irresponsible banking sector, um, and environmental protection. Now, has the EU done enough? No, most certainly not. But it's done better than this government. We, 80% of these environmental laws we've got in the UK come from um, the EU. 
For example, also, the EU capped bankers' bonuses, something the Tories fought against. Now, as I said earlier, the EU is not perfect. It does lack democratic um, features. But it is better than the UK, where we've got first past the post and an unelected House of Lords. TTIP is a perfect example of how we can see how the Greens and other progressive activists across Europe have ensured the public became aware and campaigned heavily against this undemocratic capitalist um, and contract. It's not going to happen anymore. So we are stronger together. Let's fight for reform, but we have to stay in it. Fight for a fairer democratic Europe. Thanks, Kat. Clive, give the case for a leave. Okay, the Trade Unionists and Socialist Coalition opposes the European Union because it is an employer's union. It's a club for the rich, representing the 1% elite, um, uh, you know, designed to implement austerity on a continental-wide scale uh, in, in the interests of the capitalists of each uh, of the 28 member states against the interests of working-class people. And in the same way, if on the ballot paper on the 23rd of June was a question, do you support the economic, social and political relations that dominate British society, which see a society in which five people own more than the bottom 12 million, that you, know, you, you can't guarantee the fundamental human rights of job, uh, housing or, 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 or education and so on. If you had a vote, uh, if you were asked to give a vote of confidence to Britain, a capitalist club in itself, my answer would be absolutely not. And I think nobody here would give a vote of confidence to British capitalism. So why do we give a vote of confidence? Why should we be asking a vote of confidence to a capitalist club of 28 capitalist countries across Europe? There's absolutely no basis in my um, mind to do that. And the other reason that we would uh, argue for a leave vote on June the 23rd is the political consequences that will unfold in Britain. This is the biggest crisis the Tory party has faced since the Corn Laws in the 19th century. They could be shattered by a leave vote, um, Cameron gone, and the Jeremy Corbyn led Labour government by the end of the year. Thank you, Clive. Rob, give us the case for abstain. I think it's easy to agree with Clive that the EU is a club that was set up to advance the rather advanced European capital. I think we saw brutally in Greece the undemocratic heart of the EU how a ride roughshod over democratic mandates and how it's so far removed from any sort of popular accountability or control. But I think as socialists we also need to acknowledge the domestic situation that we're facing at the moment. That the EU referendum hasn't come about out of the EU restricting the development of left-wing politics in Britain. It's come about out of a crisis in the Tory party where both camps have fed into an agenda around migration, racism, and the Brexit camp in particular has built up an argument around British nationalism which is fundamentally anti-migrant. I think we have to recognise that however much we should take a principled Brexit position, it's not a position that we'll find on the ballot paper. We have neither a hand on the lever that Cameron and Boris Johnson are fighting over, nor do we have a mass movement at our disposal to force the hand of those at the lever. Uh, I'm not going to advocate lesser evilism. I don't believe that we can vote for the Remain camp on the basis that Boris Johnson is more racist than David Cameron. But equally, I believe that we need to put politics ahead of uh, any sort of formal decision we take on how we vote. I believe the best case in this scenario for is to abstain on the formal position of taking a vote, but a propaganda campaign over the nature of the European Union while facing the key domestic argument, which is over defending the right of migrants, both economic migrants and refugees, and fighting for solidarity in the workplace with the millions of EU nationals that make their home in the UK. Thank you, Rob. Okay, now we're into round three and a few short questions. Let's start with this question. Why are we having this referendum anyway, Kat? The fact is that, I mean, how would you rank this as importance in this country compared to the way we treat us disabled people, the way we pe retreat, uh, sorry, the way we um, treat uh, asylum seekers? What about the privatization of the NHS? How about a referendum on that? Or what about the way this country treats its corporate scumbags like Phil Green, oh sorry, uh, Sir Philip Green, or uh, Mike Ashley? I mean, why is this such an important question? Well, I, I think this is something about the Conservative Party. Cameron needed to please his backbenchers. And I think it's quite, I mean, my personal opinion was I was not in favor of the referendum. 
although we in the Green Party, we agreed with it because we want democratic participation. And to be quite frank, this has been a referendum. It has been long coming. Um, in the last few years, the EU has been used a lot as a scapegoat. Um, immigration has been an increasingly a subject which I'm really concerned about. But um, the public wants to have um, and made the, you know, make the choice. And I think they've got a right to do so. Okay, Clive, let me ask you. Well, let's just say you were invited to speak at a meeting of activists, maybe those concerned with nuclear weapons and CND, or say uh, anti-frackers like where I live in Sheffield or uh, Rydale. And they said, Clive, tell us why we should leave the EU. How is that going to support the campaign against fracking? Or how is that going to support, in fact, um, the campaign against nuclear weapons? What would you tell them? We've got 30 seconds. Well, that's an interesting one, fracking and energy policy. The EU is not a friend of the environment. Cass is wrong on that. Um, you know, the carbon emissions um, uh, and trading, your trading system doesn't um, solve the issue of climate change. It's a market solution. And in fact, the EU is pushing the liberalisation of the energy uh, sector. Jeremy Corbyn is in favour, or has raised the idea in the past, of nationalisation of the energy companies. That's ruled out under EU regulations. And how's this government been on fracking? The government has, uh, has, has pushed through that liberalisation, that liberalisation so agenda as well. Be better safe for I think it'd be very good to get rid of David Cameron and, and precipitate a crisis in the Tory Party and get a general election and, and the possibility the and the possibility and the possibility of a Corbyn government and Corbyn opposes fracking. Okay, Rob, you've argued that people should abstain on the twenty third of uh, June. Isn't that just sort of left wing playground politics? Isn't that sort of, um, neither one is great option, but shouldn't the left back one side or the other? I think in a civil war in your opponent's camp, you can sit back and watch them tear themselves to pieces without lending your support to either side. I think the key argument for the left isn't to pretend we can influence the outcome of the referendum, but to fight to mitigate the effects of kind of the anti-migrant sentiment that's being built up and try to extend and find ways of building solidarity amongst our own side for the fights that are more important over the coming months. Right, okay. Let me ask you a question now, Kat. What's, what is your view of how the EU has dealt with Greece over the past year and a half? Why should we vote for Remain? Isn't, it, isn't the bloody EU just a bankers and bosses club? Well, well, absolutely. I think how they treated Greece is appalling. I'm not making any excuses for the EU. As I said, the EU is not perfect. But I would like to change it. I would like to fight for reform, and we have to be part of the EU to do so. Look at Yanis. He's been campaigning alongside other progressive politicians and activists and the Greens to ask for another Europe is possible. We need to stay in, make Europe more democratic, more social, more equal, and I believe that is possible. We'll get back to that. Clive, last night I read a Facebook post by a mate of mine from Nottingham. It went, is every Brexiteer a chronic racist, a backward immigrant hating member of the Little Britain tendency? Of course not. That's a ridiculous suggestion. Is every chronic racist, every backward immigrant hating member of the Little British, Little Britain tendency a Brexiter? Mostly yes. What do you think about that? Is that an accurate assessment? Of who? Of David Cameron? No, no, of the people, of the campaign. <laughs> right. Exactly, but that's, but that's my answer, Alan. That's, you know, um, Read out the description again and apply it to half the Tory backbenchers, no, I'm, you know, who, including, including those who support Remain. I'm talking about the Remain. Boris Johnsons, I'm talking about average people, the people who are sort of flocking behind this cross of Brexit. Is, is that not happening? They are flocking behind, if you want to use that phrase, on the class basis. Polly Tom, you put it well in The Guardian, actually. This is a question of class. It's crystal clear, actually, that it's working class people who feel they've lost control of their, of their lives, jobs, housing, their communities, who are rebelling against the EU, and, and correctly so. So, so uh, what you're saying is, in fact, you don't agree with this assessment, that this sort of, what they call in the United States, the redneck crowd, is sort of getting in behind Brexit. I'm glad you raised the question in the United States. There's lots of similarities between the Saunders supporters and the Trump supporters in the sense they're angry at the elite, they're angry at the establishment. That's 
found a reflection on a silly question on a ballot paper on the 23rd of June, but it will be a, a 12, 13 million people voting for that leave option, and they'll be putting their own content into that, and the most important part of that content is we, ha um, we are fed up with the establishment what it's doing to us. Okay, Rob. Aren't you just a voice crying in the wilderness? I mean, I agree a lot of people are fed up with both sides and can hardly wait for the 24th of June. And if there was a really mass organized spoil your ballot campaign, I was involved in one in 20 in Canada many decades ago, that might have a real impact. But on the 24th of June, when they in fact announced the rejected ballots, which one of which will be yours, and some of your mates, and maybe some other people who are watching this video, aren't people going to say, well, I guess some people weren't sort of clear about their voting intentions. Are there, is it really going to be seen as a radical abstentionism if people, I mean, are, are you organizing people to spoil their ballots, say, no, none of the above? I think it's less damaging to acknowledge the ineffective position that you're taking than to either kind of harbour illusions that we're building kind of a mass campaign. I think too often advocates of Lexit do. I think it's also less damaging than actively sowing illusions that the EU that's destroyed Greece is in the process of destroying Spain, Ireland and Italy can be reformed. So we're not, I'm not campaigning for a mass campaign of abstention. We don't have the ability to do that. But I do think we can carry an argument that actually it's our own ruling class that's inflicting the austerity of Britain. Austerity comes from Westminster, not the European Union. Thank you. But are you saying that people then, on the 23rd of June, are you going to vote yourself? Uh, I won't be voting myself. Yeah. I'll go to the ballot box, partly out of the personal thing to show that I'm not being lazy. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the fundamental question of British politics at the moment is how do people start to understand how far Corbynism can go, the limits of the British state, and how we start to build our own power. And debates around the EU are often being quite distorting on the left's ability to focus on our own priorities. Okay. And now we come to the next round where I ask each one of you a question and turn, then you jump in. A slogan put forward by Left Remain is stay in Europe to change Europe. Can you be specific what this means? What's the, what it means in practical terms? How it's really possible? We keep hearing there's going to be another Europe as possible. Tell us, give us some details. Well, for, for example, we would like that uh, these meetings, you know, the commission meetings, the council meetings and so on, are live streamed, that people actually can see what is being discussed and can participate and be informed. It's, it's these secret meetings, the lack of transparency is a real problem. And we need to educate people, we need to help people that they know what's actually going on and what's being discussed on their behalf, on our behalf. And are you convinced, do you think the change, is another Europe possible, Clive? It's like saying change NATO, stay in NATO to change NATO. It's a ludicrous position. The EU is an alliance between 28 capitalist states. The power rests in the Council of Europe, which is the heads of states. They decide the European Parliament has no power to even initiate legislation. And, and really, the only way you could ch change that in that sense would be to overthrow all 28 capitalist governments, which I'm in favour of. But let's at least start, you know, in Spain, the Spanish government facing you know, Podemos wins, Greece, Britain, let's at least start the struggle where it's uh, at. Rob, what do you think about this? Is there, is there, can we have another Europe as possible? I don't think we need to disentangle the fact that another Europe is possible. Mm. You can have a Europe of solidarity, but another Europe being possible could only happen through the breakup of the EU, which yeah. is Absolutely. structurally enshrined in a manner that yeah. represents the interests of the biggest capitalists within Europe. Yeah. You can't change something from its core purpose. But I, I completely disagree. If you look at the EU, it has been evolving and changing since the beginning, more drastically than we've seen any changes in the UK democracy. And I think that's absolutely crucial here. Of course, we've got a progressive alliances across Europe who are keen to change, and that's what we need to do. We need what to work all together. Well, all, the, there are left parties. You know, the Greens are at the moment the fifth largest part, um, alliance um, group in the European. In Parliament, and um, we've got you know the left um, is coming up in several um, countries. We're working together, and that's important. The working together, we cannot go back in time and leave. If we want a progressive 
working together solution. We need to stay in and fight for reform. But and it's been reforming since. This reform, well, what's this, mm. well, I first is the reform going to be I having would, transparent I, sessions? But yes, and I would want that the European Parliament can propose a um, law, for example. Parliament on television in this country, you know. Yeah, but with this Parliament, you can't really compare. This is a big problem. We first passed the post. This democracy is a very broken democracy. At least with the European Parliament, we've got proportional representation. Actually, our votes count. We have a fairer representation. If they were able to propose legislation, then that would make a huge difference. But that's the point. That, and that is the point. If they were able to propose legislation, hmm. in effect, what Kat's saying is the Parliament needs to seize power from 28 heads of states. And, you know, it's true, Parliaments in history have seized power. In, in, in the English Civil War, but they had to execute a king to do it, and in the French Revolution as well. Frankly, the idea that the capitalist powers of Europe are going to hand power to a, a, um, an institution like the European Parliament, unless there's a mass movement to do so, is completely ludicrous. Okay, and that so mass movement was start okay, by breaking up the EU. For just one sec, Rob. Now, Rob actually has written a piece for RS21 magazine, which he states that there are no opportunities in this referendum campaign for the left on progressive forces generally. This is just not the show that, in fact, the left really can have any influence on. Do you think the left is having any influence? Is there opportunities for the left? It's a scandal that um, the left, or, or if you like, the leading trade unions haven't um, come out in favour of a leave vote. There was an opportunity. There would have been an opportunity if the left trade, even the left trade unions, if Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell had stood firm on the position of Bob Crow and Tony Benn and had actually said we oppose the, yeah, we oppose the EU. We're arguing for a left vote because we oppose TTIP. We oppose the privatisation regulations and we oppose their you know, the state rule, you know, the rules. Really answer this question. Well, what are these opportunities? But now, for the left but now, and now, but now, a few days before the poll, it's crystal clear that Corbyn hasn't done that, and that is. A problem, but I would make the point. Rob made the point actually that the EU is, a, a, you know, is a, an institution that tries to crush the Greek uh, government and so on, and therefore you have to tell the truth. And we have to say mm. it, you can't turn around and say, well, actually, in on the referendum back in June 2016, we voted in favour of this institution. Now, three years down the line, we actually want to leave it. Let's tell the truth now. This is a, a capitalist club and we should uh, 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 you know, vote against it. Uh, Rob, why don't you explain a bit more why you think there's no opportunities for the left to, to move things forward in this referendum campaign? I think there's obviously two different arguments from the two different camps. I think the problem with the left remain another Europe is possible slogan in campaigns that kind of denies the reality that mm. yes, the EU has changed and it's maybe neoliberalism has been adopted much faster in Britain, mm. but the direction mm -hmm. of travel in the EU over the last 30 years have been to ditch the legacy of the social democratic mm -hmm. politics which were informed it kind of 10, 20, 30 years ago and towards increasing neoliberal politics yeah. and increasingly undemocratic practices. But I think the problem with the Lexit campaigns, the argument that Clive puts is quite ahistoric. We knew it was obvious that from quite early on that the trade unions were going to adopt the Remain position. Mm -hmm. It's entirely sure. consistent sure. with kind of the arguments around viability that have been put, the arguments that have kind of tailed kind of the CBI and bigger forces. And I think it's absolutely true what Clive says. I admire people, we need to plant the flag over our arguments around the EU, but we can't allow the need to plant that flag to blind us to the fact that we're making propaganda and not really talking to a large can I just say, yeah, Can I just say on this point, you know, the trade unions, it's not true. And, and even, for example, the official character of the campaign, you know, the, you know, the ordination of the Johnson and Gove as the Vote Leave campaign, if the trade unions, even if the big left trade unions had put together a case to the Electoral Commission that they should have been the voice of Leave and not Johnson and, and Gove, that would have changed the character of the debate. And that was entirely on the agenda and possible. Unison had a consultation. So there, there has been a debate in the unions. The union tops support uh, the, the well, EU, the union ranks don't. Now, one of the big slogans, I'll let you all jump in on this, one of the slogans that this is being put forward particularly by the Brexit group is in fact, we need to take back control. I like to ask, 
Who is the we? Exactly. Who's the and who, and who's, who's, the, and who's the Brexit who's the group? And who's class? the Brexit group? Yeah, who is the Brexit exactly. group? Exactly, who is the Brexit well, group? Well, this slogan is, is this mean the working class? When the RMT, which is part of the Trade Union yeah. Socialist I, Coalition, I says think, that. I think this is, this is a really important a question, question you're, you're making <laughs> here, because it is seen as the EU and us. We are part of the EU, we are part of Europe. If you like it or not, we are part of Europe at least. And these are our neighbours. Now, I agree with some of the criticism we hearing here tonight but to say that, that it is a neoliberal club uh, completely it's not stopping us from any nationalization as you're kind of implying here but what the problem is the EU has been used as a scapegoat for such a long time by our politicians for failing really and for not protecting public services for austerity and so forth that people actually think the EU is the body whereby although not perfect it is this government has been failing and that's really what we need to see that people are kind of thinking this EU is this a strange, powerful creature we are not part of and we are kind of exposed to. It's not true. It is a democratic institution where we have a say in, we are part of, and we can change it if we need and want to. It shouldn't be they versus okay. us. Well, uh, what do you think? Can we take, can, who's the we we're talking mm -hmm. about, this idea Sorry. of taking back control? I, mean, I think this is something that both, we, both camps are falling into a degree of nationalism. There is a class divide at work in Europe. And why it's true to say that both the British state and the European Union are you know, quite rotten institutions in terms of the politics and the powers that they represent, I think it is true to say that it's easier to influence the workings of the British Parliament than it is the more remote mm -hmm. European Union. And I think when we're talking about our power, we shouldn't be talking about the power of the trade union bureaucracies to get a seat at the richest table. We should be talking about developing our capacity to carry out an argument from below huh? within the trade unions, but also more broadly within but, the But this unions. question about sovereignty in this era of monopoly capitalism 2016, what does any of this mean? In fact, on a field I used to teach intellectual property, the World Trade Organization, the World Intellectual mm. Property Organization, is much more powerful mm. than in fact the EU. Mm. Does anyone talk about mm. dropping out of of the World Trade Organization? Yes, there, absolutely. Why not? Why all not? The focus or NATO, on Europe, or NATO, Europe, Europe, Europe. or NATO, or the IMF. We're not in favour of these capitalist institutions. We're in favour of a new society. We're supposed to be socialists. But, we want socialism. We want to overthrow capitalism. But they're so, not democratic. Yeah, yeah, we're not in favour of, of the World Trade Organization. Absolutely not. Well, so aren't we Who said we were? Who said socialists were? The European Commission. But these are so. not democratic institutions. You know, NATO, the World Trade Organization. These are not democratic. It isn't a democratic yeah, institution. The council. Absolutely. The and questions. I'm not giving a vote of confidence to this country either. It's not a vote of confidence. And that's confidence. the whole point. It well, is a vote of confidence. That's what we should go, Rob. Do you think it's, I mean, this, is, this is the illusion, I think, this is somehow a democratic country, we get to vote every five years and the rest of the time, you know, with media like the Daily Mail, uh, you know, this, this is, uh, there's so many attacks on democracy when you have economic dictatorship, how do you have political democracy? Democracy is quite a nebulous concept, but we can accept that we live in a liberal democracy where we have, to a certain extent, a political franchise, without pretending that we have control over Absolutely. the major powers within the economy. Yeah and that we fight for a more sort of through-going, far-reaching form of democracy. Yeah. But I do think it's very difficult not to acknowledge that while the EU is more democratic than NATO, that is but not a particularly, you know, ingratiating statement to make. The truth okay. is that they just don't ring the bell, I think we need to end that round. We're ready for round five now, the last round. Kat, tell us now in 40, in, sorry, 45 seconds, how, in fact, does the Remain position get us closer to socialism? I think we need to work internationally to address inequality. If we um, raise workers' rights, um, if, we, if we help people in this country, an employer could easily go to another country. So we need to address this internationally. I would like to help other countries in the um, EU that they um, uh, getting to a place where people can live and work and feel better about. There's a lot of things like, for example, citizen income or looking at um, tax avoidance. We need to work together and we can do this. Now, the biggest peace project ever in human history has been the EU. And I think that's an argument to really stay in. Okay, thanks. Clive. 
45 seconds, how is this going to get us closer to socialism, the ending of class power in this country? I think everybody here on the panel, even Katz, doesn't think that the EU is a good thing as it's presently structured. As I said at the outset, it is an alliance of 28 capitalist states. And I think everybody agrees that a different Europe is necessary, even if we disagree about how to achieve it. But that's really my question, really, to everybody, I suppose, is that when was the last time the status quo was changed by voting in favour of the status quo? And on June the 23rd, there was a possibility to shake the capitalist establishment in Britain and in Europe, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I think we should seize that opportunity to really open up a new political situation in Britain and internationally. Thanks, Clive. Your 45 seconds, Rob. Why should people abstain, give two fingers up to this referendum? I mean, I think Clive's finished on the strongest argument for Brexit, the argument that the crisis of the Tories that will be unleashed will be so damaging for the establishment that it gives the left the ability to advance, and we shouldn't be pessimistic about our ability to do that. I mean, I think I would say two things. One is, whatever the outcome of the referendum, there will be a massive crisis in the Tory party. Mm -hmm. No party can go through a prolonged period of civil war over such a fundamental question and not damage itself ahead of a general election. I think it's very likely that we'll see a general election ahead of 2020. Mm -hmm. I think it's equally true to say that the European Union, whatever the outcome, will maintain its antagonisms and that it can't resolve and will face further crises. I think the, reason, the way that abstention helps us build our case is it allows us to focus on the political questions where we do have influence without getting caught into a debate where we don't. Okay, thanks Rob. Well listen, I'd like to thank our three panellists. I thought we had a nice sort of argy-bargy with no fist fights, no uh, you motherfucker kind of stuff. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Kat, Clive and Rob. And uh, 23rd of June, just either vote or leave, vote remain, or you might even want to abstain. <laughs>